Hey everyone, my name's Tomato Anus, also known as the Air Bud of Speedrunning, and this is an any% percent speedrun of Fallout 4. So it's been a while since I've done a video dedicated solely to a Fallout 4 any% percent run, with the last solo video for the run being from early 2018. I do have two videos on my channel that contain the run that have been posted since then, the first being my video from June of 2019 explaining an anthology run, and the second being my AGDQ run from this past January, but neither of those videos fully reflect the current state or optimization of the route. The goal of this video is to try and fully explain the speedrun in real time over the gameplay as it's happening, and to be a fully self-contained video, where you don't need to watch any other of my videos to understand what's happening. Because of this, if you've seen either of the videos I've already mentioned or any of my other Fallout 4 videos from the past year or so, there might be some repeated information in here that you're already familiar with, but there is a lot of new stuff, as well as new ways the information will be presented that will hopefully make it easier to understand and follow. So, with this being an any% percent run, glitches are allowed and console commands are not. If you would prefer to watch a glitchless speedrun of Fallout 4, I have a video for that run as well that's linked in the description if you'd prefer to watch that. Also, if you hate my voice or think that speedruns just shouldn't have commentary, there's a link in the description to this run with only game audio. Also, there's a link to the run with the original audio from my stream as well. There's a couple other things that you should probably know before we get into the run, but none of them are 100% necessary to know. It would just be remiss of me to not include them in the video, but there's not much time during the run to address them. If you want to skip this section where I go over some things I often get comments on, like what patch this is played on, how the timer knows when to pause itself, and stuff like that, then click to the time that's shown on screen now. Firstly, a super common comment that people leave on speedruns of Fallout games is that it's an open-ended game that you can't truly beat. If you're one of the people who believes this, just know that this is a speedrun of the main quest, with the run officially ending when we reach the end cinematic. This run is performed on version 1.1.30, which is the first patched version of the game. This is because there are a couple glitches that are patched out that we use in this run, which I'll specifically call out when we get to them. Also, this is a completely vanilla version of the game with no mods installed. So, one of the first things you'll notice is that the game is in French. This is because there are two sections of the game with unskippable dialogue, the intro of the run up to exiting the cryopod, and the memory sequence in the middle of the run. The length of these sections vary based on what language you play in, and for the intro sequence also based on whether you're playing as Nate or Nora. The fastest combination of language and character is to play as Nate with French dialogue. Also, if you're curious, the slowest language is Japanese. You may be wondering how all of the text and, when we get there, the end cinematic are still in English, and that's because we typically install the game in English and then just replace the English dialogues file with the French dialogues file and leave the text and video cinematic files untouched. Next, this run is performed on the very easy difficulty because we take less damage and also are able to one-shot a few enemies with our 10mm, but it doesn't make a huge difference in the run. Also, during this run, our frame rate is limited to 60 FPS, as indicated by the frame counter in the top right corner. This is because the physics of the game are tied to frame rate, so if you run the game at 300 FPS, your character will naturally move a lot faster than someone who's able to only run the game at 60 FPS. In an effort to try and make the competition as fair as possible for speedrunning, all runs must be limited to 60 FPS if you're going to be submitting to the leaderboard, just so that people aren't able to buy records with a fancy PC that can run the game super fast. You may ask if that's fair for people who can't get their game to run at 60 FPS, but the physics of the game behave relatively the same between 25 and 60 FPS, so it really isn't an issue. Speaking of hitting 60 FPS, most runners will run the game on the lowest visual settings to try and make sure we hit 60 FPS when we're running through more demanding areas like downtown Boston. Another aspect of making sure that the run is fair for everyone is accounting for loading screens. People who have the ability to purchase more expensive computers would obviously have faster loading screens as well, which would put them at an advantage against people with less powerful computers. To account for this, the timer we use, which is called Live Split, reads the memory of the game and is able to tell when the game is loading. When loading is detected, the timer automatically pauses itself, ensuring that only the time when we're in control of our character is what counts towards our overall time. This doesn't apply to elevators though, because elevator rides are actually a set length of time. I wear a heart rate monitor when I stream my speedruns just as a fun little addition to the stream, but it's a cool way to show when I get nervous and stuff like that, and near the end of the run you'll really see that in full effect. Just as a frame of reference though, if you're watching my heart rate throughout the run, my resting heart rate when I'm streaming is usually somewhere between 60 and 75 beats per minute. Okay, with all that covered, let's get to the actual run. 
So when we start a new game and create our character, we're going to cycle through the preset faces in a certain pattern to time out where Codsworth will be. Codsworth roams the house while we create our characters, and if we talk to him as he's walking back towards the kitchen, we save about half a second to a second once we start the run. The run officially begins as soon as we gain control of our character after confirming what we look like. Also, the reason why I chose to play as presets 3 for both Nate and Nora is that they're the canon faces of these characters in the Fallout lore. My timer starts at minus 3.5 seconds because that's about how long it takes to gain control of our character after confirming our looks, so the timer should hit zero as soon as we start moving the character on our own accord. The beginning of the run consists mainly of just talking to Codsworth and Nora as soon as they start talking, which skips a lot of dialogue inside of the house and gets us to the apocalypse faster, which, if you ask me, is a pretty cunning ploy by Nate to try and get out of his marriage as quickly as possible. The second time we talk to Codsworth, which is when he finishes doing the dishes, requires us to wait for him to start exclaiming about Sean, but by standing exactly where we are now and looking to a specific spot in the backyard and spamming E to interact, it perfectly times it out so we interact with Codsworth the moment he starts talking for maximum efficiency. After interacting with Codsworth and then Nora, we do some spinnies to pass the time, and then we're going to stand at the front door and wait for the vault Tech rep. I'm about to absolutely ruin this game for a lot of you, but when we get to the front door and stand there staring at it, I'd like for you to just notice how the window and the door is off-centered. I figured I'd give you a moment to soak that one in. When the vault Tech rep eventually arrives and does some nagging, we're going to fill out our character name and our special stats. For our name, we just type the letter R because it's fast to type, and the R button on the keyboard is also the button to confirm our stats, so it involves less finger movement. For this run, we're going to max out both endurance and agility and then dump the rest of our points into luck. Endurance affects how slowly your AP bar drains as you sprint, and sprinting is fast, so we obviously want to do that as much as possible. Also, endurance gives you more health, which is always nice to have. Agility affects how many action points you have, and we want as much as possible because we want to be sprinting as much as possible, and we're also going to be using VATS a lot throughout the run, and that also uses up action points. The reason why we dump the rest of our points into luck is that it's the fastest stat to dump our points into, as the final three points we have available to assign don't matter. We could technically assign them to intelligence for bonus experience, or something like charisma for speech checks, but even if we had those extra points in those stats, it wouldn't make the run any faster. We don't have to do any speech checks throughout the run, so charisma doesn't matter, and our level is pretty irrelevant since we only take one perk for pickpocketing throughout the whole run, so intelligence is irrelevant as well because no other perks would be beneficial to us in the run. You may remember that in the past we would take Action Boy for the bonus AP regeneration, or Solar Powered for the bonus endurance, but those are both antiquated strats. You'll see why we don't take those anymore later on in the run. After interacting with our spouse, child, and robot a few times, we're going to absolutely book it out of the house, leaving Nora and Sean in a dust cloud as we ask them if they've never taken a shortcut before and leap some garden fences. We then run across a log to cross a creek, avoiding having to use a rope swing and pull a Leslie Burke. When we run up this hill and approach the military officer at the gate, we mash E to talk to him, and then mash it again as we finish saying the word list at the end of our line, which makes us say our line again, skipping the officer's line and letting us run on through to the vault. When we finally reach the Vault 111 platform, Nora will appear out of nowhere moments before a bomb goes off in the distance, and we get lowered into the vault. When we eventually load into the vault, we'll still be on the elevator and going down the elevator shaft. There, we're going to spam the escape button as the platform moves down. If we press escape fast enough, our character will slowly clip through the floor and fall way below the elevator, allowing us to walk right through the protective grating as if we're a T-1000 because the collision for the grating hasn't loaded in yet. This is a trick called Clip into Vault Elevator, or Clive for short. The timing on when we start spamming escape is actually a bit tricky because if you start too soon, you'll fall too far of a distance and lose all of your health to fall damage or cripple your legs. If you start spamming too late, you won't be able to get through the grating before the collision loads. When performed successfully, dropping through the platform and walking through the grating saves around 15 seconds. A 2 minute and 40 second cutscene is about to begin, so we're going to jump right into explaining a bunch of complicated stuff that's about to happen, namely three different glitches. First one is the most simple. When the cutscene ends, we're going to skip most of the vault with item climbing and clipping. 
This is done several times throughout the run and is performed by simply picking up an object, looking straight down and walking backwards into a wall. In the vault, we're going to perform a variation of it that I refer to as VLC clipping, since we perform the clips with cones. Alright, first glitch explained, now the second glitch requires a bit of precursory knowledge. Every area you load into in this game is called a cell, and they're their own little individual maps like Vault 111 and the Wasteland, they're both cells. Every cell has its own coordinate grid, with an origin point of 000 being somewhere in the grid. The location of your character is stored in the game's memory as a coordinate based on where you're located on this grid of the cell you're in. Vault 111 has an origin point and so does the Wasteland and every other cell. So the next glitch, which is called a punch warp, allows us to store what our coordinate value is in our current cell and then teleport back to those coordinates in either the cell we're currently in or to those coordinates in another cell. So if we set up a punch warp when we're standing at the coordinate minus 25, 120, 15 in Vault 111, and then we go into the Wasteland and trigger our punch warp, we'll get teleported to the coordinates minus 25, 120, 15 in the Wasteland. Punch warping is done by attempting to melee attack an enemy or object in VATS when VATS thinks that you should be able to attack it, but your orientation to the object that you're attacking makes pathfinding difficult. If what you're targeting is in a hard to get to place that would require your character to either clip through objects or go out of bounds, then the game has to think for a moment about how it'll get your character next to the target. This is indicated by the game going into a weird inside your head third person camera, or a third person camera that seems like just a slight offset of where the first person camera should be. If you cancel your attack while the game is in this weird state, then the coordinates of where you're standing get stored, and the next time you attempt to melee attack something in VATS, you'll get teleported to those coordinates in whatever cell you're in. You'll see me set up a punch warp in a moment on a rad roach, but I won't be triggering it until we're outside. That's it for punch warping. The final glitch that you'll be seeing in a second is called COC2. COC is a term used in creation engine games that stands for Center on Cell. In each cell, there's a set COC location chosen by the developers. This is typically near where the player would enter the location. Should the player fall out of bounds, rather than fall for the rest of eternity, they'll instead eventually hit an invisible barrier that we refer to as the COC plane. When you hit this, you get teleported back to the COC location in your current cell. Alternatively, in Fallout 4, if you're directly beneath solid ground in the cell when you hit the COC plane, you'll get warped straight upwards to the ground above you, rather than the COC point. This is referred to as an upwarp. The COC plane is finite in size, meaning that if you jump out of bounds, you can go past the edge of the plane and even fall even further past the COC plane. Rather than fall forever, there's an additional plane which we believe to be the cell floor, and when you hit it, it behaves as a COC plane, which is why we call this COC2. If in Vault 111 we jump out of bounds around the COC plane and then turn around while falling and fall beneath the elevator that we normally ride to exit the vault, when we hit the COC2 plane, we'll get warped to the top of the elevator, which is where the load zone to exit the vault is. This skips riding the elevator up and saves around 30 to 40 seconds compared to riding the elevator normally. When we gain control, we ditch our spousicle and begin to run through the vault. Our first stop is picking up a security baton, which enables VATS for us so we can set up a punch warp soon. We're then going to perform the first item clip of the run to skip most of the vault, and after the first clip, we'll pick up another cone for the second clip that's coming up soon because the first cone doesn't come through the ceiling with us. With the second cone in hand, we now run over to a rad roach and position ourselves funny to set up a punch warp by targeting the rad roach and canceling the attack immediately. We now perform the second VLC clip to get onto the roof of the vault, where we perform a couple tight jumps and a pixel walk. We follow this up with falling out of bounds past the extents of the COC plane, and then turn around to fall underneath the elevator where we quick save and quick load, which COCs us immediately, bringing us to the loading screen for exiting the vault. Exiting the vault this way skips grabbing the pit boy, but when you exit the vault, the game checks to make sure you have it, and if you don't, then the game automatically gives it to you. The only problem is that it's invisible until you either quit to the main menu or enter power armor, but we'll be quitting to the main menu shortly after exiting the vault to perform another glitch, so the pit boy being invisible doesn't really affect us. Outside the vault, we immediately ran down the hill to the closest house in Sanctuary, which contains some rad roaches. Here we're going to trigger our punch warp by attacking one in VATS, which begins to teleport us across the map to the coordinates of where we set up the punch warp in Vault 111. After loading for a moment, we'll be beneath the map, and by holding S to move backwards, we'll be positioned under the map right by Green Tech Genetics, where we're going to upwarp to. This is fantastic since Green Tech Genetics is an important location in the story of the game, and we have to come back here later, so by discovering it now, we can just fast travel back later. 
When we discovered green tech just now, we made a quick save in preparation for a glitch called load warping, which I'll explain later because there's no time to right now. Just remember the fact that immediately upon discovering green tech, I made a quick save and I load warp upon entering the sewer. This sewer is actually a late game area with a lot of stuff here that has to deal with end game quests, but that'll be apparent in a moment. When we load into the sewer, we're going to immediately quit to the main menu, followed by pressing continue to load the autosave that was made when we entered the sewer. If you load a save that was made underwater from the main menu, you'll load at the water's surface, which just so happens to be out of bounds inside of this sewer. By then navigating in the water out of bounds and swimming alongside a specific pipe, we hit a trigger which gives us the quest Nuclear Option, which, if you're unfamiliar with the game, is the final quest in the main story. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean we can just go and finish the game the second. In order to finish the story, we have to be able to enter the Institute, which is most quickly done by building a teleporter because the other entrances aren't available for us to use. In order to build a teleporter, we need teleporter plans and a decoded Courser chip, which requires us to go through Kellogg's memories, which requires more and more things. You get the picture. We have a long list of things to do in order to enter the Institute, but once we enter the Institute, we're able to finish the game. The first thing we're going to do is some shopping, to get some items to speed up the run. After using an enamel bucket to item climb up onto a bridge, and running past a raider in their doge, we're going to run to Good Neighbor, picking up a frag mine along the way. Frag mines are an excellent item to have in the speedrun because you can target them in vats. This means that we can use them to set up punch warps and don't have to rely on enemy positioning and locations to set up punch warps at specific coordinates. We enter Good Neighbor by jumping into a load zone that's located in this alley, and along the way we were sure to run along the left side of an old semi-trailer to discover the old corner bookstore location for later. When we load into Good Neighbor, we're going to immediately shop with Cleo and perform one of the glitches that was patched out in later versions of the game. By buying a full ammo stack and then selling back about 7 eighths of the stack, it will lock the remaining 1 eighth in our inventory to sell back over and over, and after doing it enough times, when we try to buy the big ammo stack again, it will instead sell it over and over to Cleo, building up an insane amount of store credit. We use our newfound wealth to purchase a 10mm with some ammo, an expensive chest piece and grief, all of Cleo's frag mines, as well as a few pipe pistols for performing item clips later, and then speak with Daisy through a wall to whom we sell the chest piece and grief that we just bought to get store credit, and buy a piece of armor called the Destroyer's Left Leg, as well as a biometric scanner. We then immediately stole the Fat Man and Mini Nuke that were behind Cleo, made a quick save, and loaded the autosave from the sewer. Here we're going to perform another load warp. So, load warps are a way to load old saves but maintain progress. By making a quick save and then loading an old save and entering a door or a transition to another cell, and quick loading with precise timing, instead of loading in on the other side of the door as the character from the old save you loaded, you'll instead load in as the character from the quick save. So instead of exiting the sewer as the person who just entered the sewer in the autosave, we'll exit as the person who just did all the shopping who also has several additional locations discovered as well as the final quest. When we exit the sewer, we're going to immediately bind our 10mm, Fat Man, Security Baton, Frag Mines, and the Destroyer's Left Leg. When we exit the Pip Boy, we're going to then equip our Frag Mines and Leg Piece with our Hotkeys, and the reason why I hotkeyed the leg instead of just equipping it like normal will become apparent in a bit. So the Destroyer's Left Leg has an armor effect that increases our move speed by 10%, which is pretty neat, but this is a speedrun and we have an insatiable lust for speed, so we're now making our way over to Bunker Hill to do some more shopping. After we just leaped over some water, we stand in a precise spot, throw a frag mine up, and make a save the moment we let go, followed by setting up a punch warp on the frag mine in the air. We now have our coordinates stored to that location, and we made the save because we're going to be performing that same punch warp over and over pretty soon, so we can just load the save we made again and again to be able to set up the punch warp multiple times. When we arrive at Bunker Hill, we're going to talk with Deb and perform the second of three glitches that are patched out. Deb has two armor pieces we want, so by putting an item in our inventory that we don't want into her inventory, and then pressing both E to select and R to confirm at the same time while hovering on the item in her inventory that we want, the item will move over to our inventory and will be prompted with confirming the trade even though we don't have the caps for it. We do this twice, offering up our Vault 111 jumpsuit and wedding ring for a Black Ops chest piece and a Black Ops right shin guard. After hotkeying both of the Black Ops pieces just now, we fast traveled to Green Tech Genetics and equipped them with the hotkeys as we load in. Giving up our jumpsuit means that we'll be running around with just our tidy whities on under some leg and chest armor, but we don't have our wedding ring anymore, so that means it's legal for us to openly flirt with people like this. So the reason why we wanted these two armor pieces specifically is that the chest piece gives us one bonus endurance, but more importantly, the shin guard has a 10% bonus speed effect on it. 
the creation engine stacks additively. So that means right now, with both the destroyer's left leg and Black Ops right shin guard equipped, we're moving at 120% speed. For the sake of visual representation, these nice khakis represent wearing both of the leg pieces, and I'm just going to refer to both of them collectively as pants. So, while wearing the pants right now, we have 120% movement speed. Currently, we're on our way to Diamond City, where we're going to perform a VLC clip to enter Diamond City from the rear, skipping having to talk with Piper and Mayor McDonough. Inside of Diamond City, we're going to do two things. Well, now that I think about it, I guess it's three. The first thing is super quick, and is just making a save outside of the chapel. This is for load warping later, and right before we do it, we're going to walk in a weird way to the left of the door to break away from the dialogue of Pastor Clements, so when we load the save later, we aren't in dialogue with him. The second thing we'll be doing is just running across town and entering and exiting Nick Valentine's detective agency. Normally, you rescue Nick in Park Street Station at Vault 114, and then track down the bald dude who gave our spouse a migraine earlier, and then have a confrontation with the bald dude whose name is actually Kellogg. Playing casually, you're not allowed to confront Kellogg without rescuing Nick, but we're going to sequence break meeting Kellogg, and talk with him before ever meeting Nick. Even with this sequence break, you usually would have to still go rescue Nick, but there's a trigger inside of his detective agency where if you enter the agency once, and then talk with Kellogg, Nick will get teleported to the agency and we won't have to rescue him in Vault 114, so that's why we enter the agency. The final thing we do is a glitch called armor stacking, and it both speeds up the run tremendously and also grinds it to a halt. It's what's going on right now on your screen and there's a lot to it, but don't worry, it takes a while so we have plenty of time to explain it. So when we exited the agency, we threw a frag mine and activated the punch warp we set up on our way to Bunker Hill. This warped us to an area out of bounds in Diamond City where we fell into a weird black pit. This black pit is what we call a hex zone, and it corrupts our game. We're unable to do anything while in the hex zone. Can't pull up any weapons, can't pull up our pit boy, pretty much nothing. So, with our game corrupted, we made a quick save and then load warped on the chapel door that we made a save in front of when we entered Diamond City. When we load warped on this door, we loaded in on the other side as the character who just entered the hex zone, but we now have full control again because we're no longer in the hex zone. One of the things that also happened when we entered the hex zone is it unequipped all of our items, but we maintained all of our armor effects. So upon completing the load warp, we still have the 20% extra move speed and the one extra endurance from our armor, but with none of the armor equipped. We can then re-equip the armor by pressing all of the hotkeys for them and stack those armor effects. So we have the 20% extra movement speed from before, as well as an additional 20% from the armor we just equipped, and also two total bonus endurance from the stacked chest pieces. We're going to do this process a total of nine times, where we load the save we made earlier and set up the punch warp again, then trigger the punch warp in Diamond City to enter the hex zone, and then exit the hex zone and stack our armor. We originally had 120% move speed and 11 endurance, so after performing 9 stacks, we'll have 300% move speed and 20 endurance. I actually did the math to figure out the optimal number of stacks, and for any of you math junkies like me, here's my work for how I set up a formula for it that I then plugged into an online calculator to find the minimum total time value as a variable of number of stacks. After I equip everything after exiting the hex zone, I then make a quick save, load the old save, and set up the punch warp again. During the loading screen while I wait for the old punch warp save to load, I have to mash my VATS button to make sure I set up the punch warp immediately because there's a pretty narrow window after loading where you're able to set it up. Because of pressing the VATS button in the loading screen, you'll see whatever item is on the loading screen get highlighted a lot with my HUD color. I know that this is a lot of information about stacking just being dumped on you, but let's just summarize really quickly. We're punch warping to an area that corrupts our game. This unequips our armor, but keeps the armor effects. We then fast travel out of the corrupted area and re-equip our armor to stack whatever effects we had before with more equipped armor effects. This is followed by quick saving and loading an old save to set up another punch warp. We then quick load and trigger the punch warp, starting the process over. So by now, you probably noticed the small map in the bottom right corner of the screen, and you may be asking what it is. That's actually the official Fallout 4 Pip-Boy mobile app that was released alongside the game in 2015. So I mentioned earlier that when we enter the hex zone, we don't have access to our Pip-Boy, meaning we can't fast travel out of the hex zone. However, we can still use the Pip-Boy app to fast travel, which means that for most of the stacks, we can just punch warp into the hex zone and then fast travel out to then stack our armor. 
We couldn't do this for our first armor stack though, which is why we did the load warp on the door for that one. Because we skipped grabbing the Pip-Boy in the vault, when the game automatically gives one to you, it has limited uses. The two main things are that the Pip-Boy screen is still dusty because we never brushed it off, as you may have noticed earlier, and that the Pip-Boy app doesn't recognize us as having a Pip-Boy in the game, so we can't use the app. For some reason, performing the load warp from the hex zone gives us back all of our Pip-Boy capabilities, including an undusted screen and use of the Pip-Boy app. So that's why we had to load warp for the first stack, and we can fast travel for the rest. If you've seen this run in the past, you may remember that use of the Pip-Boy app wasn't allowed. However, when this method of stacking was discovered, the Fallout 4 speedrunning community held a discussion and official vote to determine whether or not the app should be allowed. We decided that it should be allowed, due mainly to the fact that without using the app, the method for stacking involves a lot of difficult load warps and the run is a lot less accessible to new runners due to the load warps. It's also a first party app that was released by Bethesda and not some sort of third party mod. We do have a couple rules about using the app though. The main one is that it has to be ran using an emulator on your computer rather than on a smartphone. This is because we don't want to require people to buy smartphones to be able to speedrun the game and using an emulator allows for everyone to use the app. The second thing is that anytime you're interacting with the app, you have to display it on screen for verification purposes and capture your cursor as well. This is just so that all gameplay and actions pertaining to the run are reviewable by moderators on speedrun.com. There aren't many times in the run though where it's beneficial to use the app. Most of the time, it's way faster to just use your in-game Pip-Boy to menu and fast travel, so you'll only really be seeing the app used during this segment and one other part of the run to quickly fast travel. Once we finish stacking, we're going to pick up our frag mine we threw down at the entrance of Diamond City earlier and exit the park. When we finish loading, we're going to make a quick save and a hard save for load warping later, and then fast travel to Vault 111. There, we're going to run a bit to the north to a specific tree where we're going to set up a punch warp. After we set it up, we're going to quick load to be back outside of Diamond City and then run to a specific spot and trigger the punch warp, but it's not going to bring us straight back to the tree that we set it up at. The wasteland, while technically one big cell, is actually made up of a bunch of smaller cells that we refer to as chunks, and only a few chunks are ever loaded at one time, so the whole wasteland doesn't have to be loaded constantly. For some reason, when you punch warp across the wasteland over super large distances, even larger than our punch warp to green tech, you don't warp straight from where you activate the punch warp to where you set it up. Instead, you first load into several of the chunks between you and the destination. You don't load them in any particular order, like you don't necessarily load the one closest to where you trigger it first, and then the one closest to the destination last. In fact, it kinda seems like you load ones closer to the destination first. Anyways, for some reason, when you're doing all this chunk loading, our punch warp will actually stop short of where we set it up, and we'll end up at one of the places where we load a chunk. And with this punch warp, that location is directly over the roof of the Museum of Freedom, which is absolutely stellar because we need to do some stuff with the Minutemen real quick. Also, when we were loading in all those chunks, one of them was in Lexington and it caused us to discover that location, so we now have Lexington discovered. On the roof, we quickly made a save for setting up a punch warp later, and then enter the Museum of Freedom, equipping our 10mm in the process. As soon as we load in, we level up to take the pickpocket perk because pickpocketing is the only reason why we're here and it's nice to not fail it over and over. So when we got the nuclear option quest earlier in the run when we went into the sewer, it spawned a quest item in the inventory of an NPC named Sturges who was a part of the Minutemen faction. Part of being able to end the game when we enter the institute in this speedrun is having this quest item in our inventory, so we're here to pickpocket this item off of Sturges. This requires us to delete all the raiders inside with our NA aim because the door to the room Sturges is in only opens when you get rid of them all, and if we don't eliminate them and just clip into the room, then there's no way to pickpocket Sturges. We shot Sturges a few times to aggro the Minutemen, which skips a dialogue that we would normally have to sit through before pickpocketing Sturges. After stealing the quest item which is called the Institute Relay Targeting Sequence, we made a quick save and loaded the save we made when we exited Diamond City, where we just performed a load warp. This brings the character who just pickpocketed Sturges to inside of Diamond City, where we're free to fast travel, rather than being inside of the Museum of Freedom and unable to fast travel. While loading after performing the load warp, I pull up the Pip-Boy app to prepare it for fast traveling to Lexington because we're going to be going there soon and it's slightly faster to use the app when fast traveling to Lexington. It's worth noting that whenever we load warp, the loading process takes longer because the game has to go through the loading process twice. Once for loading the quick load, and the other for loading the character from the quick load into the location we're currently at. 
When we fully loaded in, we then immediately fast traveled to the Boston Police rationing site, bringing us to another loading screen. This location is where we triggered the punch warp to the Museum of Freedom from when we ran into the back of the bus. This marks the beginning of the longest running segment of the speedrun, where we need to run all the way to the southwest corner of the map to discover two locations. The Crater of Adam, which is where we'll be triggering a punch warp from, and the Rocky Cave, which is home to an NPC named Virgil. When we do this running segment across the map, you won't see my AP bar come up at all or drain at all. Remember that when we did the stacking segment, we were also stacking a chest piece that gave us bonus endurance. Right now we're sitting at 20 endurance, which means our AP bar drains incredibly slowly when we're sprinting. In fact, if you get a character with 21 endurance, you have infinite sprint because your AP bar doesn't drain anymore when you sprint. Because we're so close to this value, and we run so fast, we can get pretty much anywhere in the game without our AP bar fully draining. And the reason why the AP bar isn't popping up on screen to show it draining super slowly is that your AP bar only shows up once you get below a certain threshold. It's somewhere in the 80 to 90% range. Because our endurance is so high, we don't ever cross that threshold, so our AP bar never pops up. Now, you may be asking why we can't just punch warp across the map to the southwest corner and we have to run there instead. Keep in mind that to punch warp across the map, you need to set up a punch warp that is either at the coordinates of your end goal, or is even further past your end goal if we're going to do something like the punch warp we did to the Museum of Freedom. Well, the southwest corner of the map is so extreme that there's no known cells that have coordinates that overlap with that part of the map. Because all cells have an origin point that is typically in the playable area, that means that a cell would have to be the same size of the wasteland in the southwest direction, or even bigger to have coordinates that would overlap with the glowing sea region of the map. It's a lot to ask from a cell in this game, and none are that big, so we can't just set up a punch warp somewhere else in the game and use that to skip running across this area of the map. When we finished our run to the Rocky Cave, we made a save for load warping later and then alt-tabbed to interact with the Pip-Boy app and quickly fast travel to Lexington. Earlier I mentioned that we need to build the teleporter to enter the Institute, and to do that we need to ally with one of the factions in the game. We stole from the Minutemen earlier so it might be awkward to side with them, so we're instead going to side with the Railroad. The reason we're in Lexington now is that this is where the quest to prove your loyalty to the railroad takes place. Normally you come here with an NPC named Deacon, fight a bunch of robots that can feel, and retrieve an item called Carrington's Prototype. Now, we don't have this quest yet, we haven't even met the railroad, but by entering the building that Carrington's Prototype is in and clipping out of bounds to upwarp into the room the prototype is in, and then picking up and dropping the prototype, we're automatically given the railroad loyalty quest and the quest is at the stage where we just need to turn the quest in for completion. Also, we picked up another mini nuke that was right by Carrington's prototype. Upon exiting the basement, we then fast travel to the Crater of Adam, where we immediately will make a quick save and then load the save we made when we landed on the roof of the Museum of Freedom. It's on the roof of the Museum of Freedom that we're going to set up another punch warp and then quick load to be back at the Crater of Adam. We're going to trigger another punch warp that will behave like the one to the Museum of Freedom earlier where we're going to load across different chunks in the map, but this time we're going to mash to pull up our Pip-Boy shortly after triggering the punch warp. If we time it correctly, then we'll pull up our Pip-Boy after loading into a chunk that places us just outside of Fort Hagen, which is where the bald dude named Frosted Flakes is located. So right here is us loading back into the Crater of Adam and throwing down a frag mine, which we then attack in vats to trigger our punch warp, and we then load briefly and start mashing to pull up our Pip-Boy after our compass pops up, and then when our Pip-Boy gets pulled up, it stops our punch warp in place and we're at Fort Hagen. Like I said earlier, we're not supposed to be here without having met up with Nick Valentine, but we're just going to perform some clips with pipe pistols to be able to gain access to Fort Hagen and then also arrive at Frosted Flakes. The first clip is on the roof of Fort Hagen, so after running up some scaffolding, we enter the building by clipping into a room with an elevator that will ride down. Inside the elevator, we equip our Fat Man in preparation for talking to Frosted Flakes because, as many of you may know, we're going to use a big gun skill check when talking to him. We drop another pipe pistol and position ourselves ready for the doors to open so we can then climb up the side of some lockers in the hallway and drop to the hallway below us. There we'll talk with Frosted Flakes about giving our spouse a migraine and taking away Sean, and it's all resolved by just having a quick negotiation and him giving us all his belongings, including some cybernetic enhancements. After then grabbing a military grade circuit board and reading a log on the terminal to update a quest, we quick save and load warp back to Diamond City. 
After completing this load warp, we'll now be the character who has Frosted Flake stuff and will be inside of Diamond City, where we're going to then immediately fast travel to the Old Corner Bookstore. This is the location we discovered a while ago when we were running to enter Good Neighbor and ran along the left side of an old semi-trailer. From the bookstore, we're going to run across town to the Old North Church and meet up with the railroad. As I mentioned earlier, we have to ally with one of the factions in order to build the teleporter. In the current route we do that with the railroad, but it's only been this way since the spring of 2017. Before then, we would always side with the Minutemen. The thing is, siding with the Minutemen and the railroad in the speedrun play out very similarly in terms of what we have to accomplish in the run. The plus side to siding with the railroad is that the loyalty quest is a lot quicker to do, and we also don't need to rescue the Minutemen when we side with the railroad, so we can skip the whole Deathclaw fight and all the stuff that goes alongside with bringing the Minutemen to Sanctuary. The discovery of the fact that siding with the railroad is faster than the Minutemen went alongside with the discovery of punch warping, so it is a bit tricky to say exactly how much faster the railroad is than the Minutemen without factoring in any other strats that have nothing to do with the factions. But as a whole, the run is about 12 minutes faster now than it was when the final records were being set with the Minutemen route. So on our way to meet the railroad, we quickly set up a punch warp and say hello to the statue of Paul Revere, the American father of speedrunning, as we enter the church. Inside the church, we immediately punch warp out of bounds and COC in the basement, where we promptly run into some railroad members who just sit here 24-7 waiting for people to arrive so they can blind them with some floodlights. Our relationship with the railroad is going to go from 0 to 100 real quick, because we go from complete strangers, to being vouched for by the member named Deacon because he has a good feeling about us, to talking with Deacon about how we completed the mission and retrieved the prototype and should head back to the HQ, to then talking to Desdemona, the leader of the railroad again, and us joining the railroad with the codename Fixer. Also, when you first meet the railroad, because there's multiple ways for you to hear about and find them when playing the game casually, the dialogue changes where you say how you heard about them. Because of what we've accomplished in the game so far, the dialogue says we found them by following the Freedom Trail, which is pretty funny to think about with what we've actually accomplished so far. As all this dialogue winds down, we'll officially be a member of the railroad and we can eventually build the teleporter with them to enter the institute. First though, Desdemona will want to give us a tour of the HQ and give a big speech to introduce us to everyone. We're going to decline this invitation to the welcome party and skip out on the snack platters by immediately fast traveling to Lexington when we enter the HQ, then fast traveling back to the HQ, and then to the Diamond City Market. This fully skips Desdemona's welcome speech and also pushes the in-game clock to an ideal time where, if we've done everything quickly and correctly so far and continue to do so for the rest of the run, Tinker Tom won't be sleeping when we need to talk to him later. Well, let me rephrase that. He won't be sleeping in a bad bed when we need to talk to him later. There's two beds he likes to sleep in, and if he's sleeping in one of them, which is the bad bed, then we lose time. But if he's sleeping in the good bed, we won't lose any time. You'll see what I mean later. So the fast travel to the Diamond City Market also puts us in perfect position to run to Nick Valentine's detective agency for the second time and finally meet the legend himself, Nick Valentine. First things first though, when we enter and Nick and Piper are bickering, we're going to immediately disrespect Nick by running to the back and stealing a hot plate. This is scrap for building the teleporter later. After making ourselves at home, we'll then run over and wait for the bickering to end, after which we'll breeze through our first dialogue with both characters and come to the conclusion that we should head on over to the memory den in Good Neighbor. The last time we were in Good Neighbor, we didn't part on the best terms, but luckily at least 48 hours in-game have passed, so they've totally forgotten about our larceny. So just a quick catch up on the story so far, we've learned that Frosted Flakes was hired by a group called the Institute to kidnap our child, and we now have a cybernetic enhancement that was in Frosted Flakes' brain, so we're going to put his brain into Nick's head and then explore his memories to determine the location of the Institute. This is because the Institute is a super secret location and no one actually knows where it is. To solve this conundrum, we turn to the memory den. Now, the memory den has always been a big roadblock in the run, with it essentially being a 5 minute auto scroller, but a lot of progress has actually been made recently. It's a lot faster now, but we still have to go through the memories to some extent, but I do still have a $250 bounty out for it if someone can find a way to skip having to enter the memories in a way that is both applicable to the any% percent run, and also faster than going through the memories how we do now. Inside the memory den we speak with Amari and Nick and agree to go through with putting Frosted Flake's brain piece inside of Nick. 
Again, this is so we can explore Frosty Flakes' memories and determine where the Institute is located, and yes, that is the actual plot. After talking, we're then going to set up a punch warp in the corner and run to the entrance of the memory den, setting up a save for punch warps later along the way. The reason we run upstairs is because Amari is about to enter a long dialogue sequence with Nick where she's installing the brain augmenter and it's pretty slow to sit through. By exiting the memory den after she says a certain line and then re-entering, it completely skips her dialogue, saving a few seconds. When we re-enter the building, we then trigger our punch warp to quickly get back down to the basement. There we'll activate the next dialogue sequence with Amari and also grab a surgical tray and bone cutter for scrap because they respectively contain aluminum and copper, which are needed when we build the teleporter later. After speaking with Amari, we'll then sit down in the memory lounger and make a quick save, and what we're about to do is a bit complicated. So when we sit down, normally there's a 30 second dialogue from Amari, but if we quick save and then load warp into the chapel door in Diamond City that we load warp to earlier, it skips her dialogue. So there's that time save there, but there's still a lot more coming. When we enter the memories, we'll have on us what's called an input enable layer, and these layers are what restricts what our character can do. They're what makes it so we can't pull up our pit boy or sprint or pull out weapons. Input enable layers have numbers assigned to them, with the numbers being either 0, 1, or 2. We learned in the past year that if you make a quick save either in the memory sequence or during the fade to white when entering the memories, and then load an old save and interact with something that gives us input enable layers like a workbench, and then quick load, when you load back into the memories, your input enable layers will be removed and will have full control. This is because the game can only store one of each value that input enable layers can be, and for some reason, having input enable layers on your character from something like a workbench while you load a save where you have input enable layers as well, makes it so that when you load the save, the input enable layers that are supposed to be loaded as well just don't get loaded because you already had the layers from interacting with the workbench. Right now, we just set up a punch warp and also have a quick save made during the fade to white when entering the memories, so by interacting with a bench and quick loading once the menu pops up, our input enable layers in the memories will be removed. There was just this awkward brief moment where we have control in Diamond City before loading into the memories because that's where we made our quick save during the fade to white, but we started loading again and in a moment we'll be fully in control in the memories albeit invisible. In the memories, we can then trigger the punch warp we set up a few moments ago to warp ourselves to near the end of the memories, and then breeze to the final memory where we still have to wait for the cutscene to play out. When we enter the final memory, we're going to enter and exit a couple times because the memory freezes itself up after entering because it's trying to figure out if it should play or not after we skipped so much of this area. After we get the memory playing, we're going to throw a frag mine and interact with it to pick it back up, which gets rid of our invisibility. The invisibility is just cosmetic, it doesn't help us hide or anything, and when we go to leave the memories, it gets removed anyways, so we just get rid of it during this sequence for fun. Having to sit through this dialogue between Frosted Flakes and the Courser is what makes the memory sequence a bit unbearable, so again, there's 250 smack ruse in it for you if you find a way to skip this with the parameters I mentioned earlier. So we do have access to our weapons now because we removed the input enable layers, but unlike with other NPCs, shooting these NPCs doesn't skip any dialogues for some reason. In fact, it does almost nothing. Frosted Flakes won't react at all if we shoot him, he won't even lose health, and he'll keep talking like normal. The Courser on the other hand will aggro to us and shoot at us, but will still talk completely normally as if we aren't shooting him. We can technically skip some of the Courser's lines if we down him while he's saying a line, but that only skips the one line and is a pretty minimal time save for the amount of ammo we'd have to use to down him, as well as the risk of losing all our health from the Courser shooting at us. Anyways, if you're interested in maybe looking into things for this section of the run, or just want to see an incredibly in-depth look at all the work we've put into this segment, I have a 30 minute video on my channel detailing everything we've looked into as of this time last year. So based on the conversation between Frosted Tips and the Courser, we learn that there is no physical entrance to the Institute and we have to teleport in. If you're familiar with the game though, you'll know that's a lie, and there are two physical entrances, but we're not able to use either of them in the speedrun due to how the quests are laid out. In fact, if we were able to use either of the physical entrances, the speedrun would probably be under 20 minutes long. 
As I just mentioned though, the quests pertaining to those physical entrances and their related triggers are laid out in a way that we aren't able to access those physical entrances without doing a lot more work than we do in the speedrun, so for now, just building the teleporter is a lot faster than trying to get those entrances to be usable. Anyways, once Frosted Tips and the Courser are done talking, we just have to wait a moment and the TV that we interact with to exit the memories becomes accessible. As we're exiting and loading back into the memory den basement, we're going to mash Q to pull up Vats and target Amari so we can quickly shoot her and skip her lines to advance the main quest. We then immediately quick save so we can load warp, and then load the save we made when we were exiting the memory den to set up a punch warp real quick, and then we'll load warp the save we made in the glowing sea outside of Virgil's lab to load warp to there. We're now beginning the stretch building up to building the teleporter now that we're no longer metagaming and our character knows that we need to build a teleporter. Virgil is a super mutant who used to be a human who worked at the institute so he knows all the ins and outs and agrees to help us build the teleporter so that we can get him a serum in the institute that will turn him back into a human. Also, two years ago when I made a video explaining the route, I made a joke about how it doesn't make sense that he hides in the glowing sea because it's not like the radiation will really stop the Institute and their synths from getting to him. Several people took issue with this joke, saying that it's actually a good idea because radiation affects robots and the synths would be affected by the radiation. I would like to counter this point with this line from Nick saying that radiation isn't an issue for him, so the Institute could clearly just send a bunch of Gen 1 and Gen 2 synths to look for and get Virgil, just like they do when they attack every other thing in the wasteland. I will not back down from this point that the radiation does nothing to protect him. Anyways, from talking with Virgil, we learned that to teleport into the Institute, we need a Courser chip, which lets Coursers teleport from anywhere in the Commonwealth to the Institute. We also learned that there's a courser somewhere in the commonwealth right now, and we can follow a radio signal to find its location, but we've played this game once or twice before, so we know that we can just go straight to green tech genetics which we discovered near the beginning of the run when we punch warped after leaving the vault. Remember that we set up a punch warp when we loaded that save in the memory den as we were leaving, and using that punch warp when we load into green tech will bring us right up to the top by an elevator. This is a pretty substantial time save. Before this punch warp was discovered, we used to spend about 30 seconds sprinting and item climbing through the entire building just to get to the elevator, and nowadays getting to the elevator is pretty instant. After we load in and perform the punch warp, we're then going to set up another punch warp before riding the elevator up. The second punch warp will be activated as soon as the elevator ride is over, and if I could eliminate one punch warp from existing, it would probably be that second punch warp. It's solely because it eliminates a really fun item climb with a box that we used to do in the run that was one of my favorite parts to perform. As we ride the elevator up, we toss out another frag mine in preparation for the final punch warp of green tech. Once the elevator doors open up, transitioning us to a new cell, we trigger our punch warp and land on top of a room where we then jump in bounds and converse with the courser. After grabbing the Courser chip, we then make a quick save, load our memory den save to set up another punch warp, and load warp to Diamond City, ready to enter the final stretch of the game, building the teleporter. So the Courser chip, while able to pinpoint the location of the Institute for us to teleport there, is encrypted, so we have to decrypt it first. Luckily, one of our fellow railroad members, Tinker Tom, is a genius and can do that for us. While our load warping and fast traveling takes forever, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you who continue to support the channel and also apologize for going so long without uploading. I hope that in the meantime since the last video, you've all been doing well and staying healthy both physically and mentally. The world isn't really in a state that makes it easy to thrive right now, but we'll get through this and I'm here with you as we try and power through it. Try to reach out to those who are close to you and let them know how you value and love them because it goes a long way and can really make someone's day. But also, don't forget to take time and love yourself because you have value as well. Getting back to the run, after fast traveling to the railroad HQ, we loot some objects for their components because we're going to be building the teleporter soon and we talk with Desdemona who will introduce us to Tom. Just to note, the main components that we're looting these objects for is their copper, ceramic, aluminum, and circuitry. Once Dez starts walking around as a prelude to introducing us to Tom, we sleep for one hour to skip Dez walking to her spot, but afterwards, we quickly shoot each of them a few times to skip some of their lines, and then grab an alarm clock for its components as well. 
When we talked to Desdemona, we aimed at her when we initiated the dialogue, which set up a glitch called a dialogue slide. This is the final glitch of the run that was patched out in later patches, and after we fast travel to the HQ, exit, and enter again to skip some dialogue, we'll trigger the glitch by aiming down sights, which will slingshot us back to where we were standing. This will put us both physically close enough and far enough into the dialogue of Tinker Tom decoding the Courser chip that we can then fast travel back to Virgil's lab to skip the rest of Tom's lines and also get the teleporter plans from Virgil. This fast travel is technically faster to do with the Pip-Boy app, but only if you do it flawlessly, so for the sake of the human element, we just use the in-game Pip-Boy to fast travel. At Virgil's lab, we're going to talk with him again and ensure him that we'll totally help him get his serum from the Institute and totally not forget about him the moment we exit his lab after our talk and that we'll for sure make sure he turns back into a human. Totally. Now that I think about it, the story of our encounters with Virgil is a bit of an allegory for the adage, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So, we've now told Virgil about how we decoded the Courser chip, and he's now handed over some plans for a teleporter, so we could head on back to our faction of choice, the Railroad. When we exit the lab, we head back to the HQ where we'll talk with Desdemona and tell her our crackpot plan to teleport into the Institute. At the end of her dialogue, we're going to blast her twice to skip some dialogue. If you haven't noticed already, you can shoot people that you're allied with up to about four times and they won't get angry at us, and it also skips whatever line of dialogue they're saying. After pumping her with lead, we run over to Tom and hand over the plans to him. We mash a bit through his lines, and after he says a certain one that indicates the quest stage updating, we walk away and grab a hot plate, followed by dropping our military-grade circuit board we grabbed after talking with Frosted Tips earlier, and we then fast travel to Sanctuary to build the base of our teleporter. The reason why we have to drop the military-grade circuit board is that it contains a lot of circuitry, which is a required material for building the base of the teleporter. If we don't drop it, for some reason, the game chooses to scrap the circuit board over scrapping other objects we have that contain circuitry, even though we need the circuit board itself for a later part of the teleporter. After building the base and arriving back at the HQ, we talk with Tom again, who pops up from his sleep because he's just so darn excited to finish the teleporter. Remember earlier when I said, if he's sleeping in the good bed, we won't lose any time? If he's sleeping in the good bed, we won't lose any time. Well, this is what I was referring to, Tom popping up from his sleep if he's sleeping in the correct bed. After we received the remainder of the plans from him, we picked back up our military-grade circuit board and fast-traveled back to Sanctuary to finish off the build. Part of building the teleporter is building all of the actual teleporter components and then powering it, which requires one small generator and then five medium-sized generators, and then connecting it all with wiring. Running out of components in a run is pretty rare, but when connecting everything in this run, I ran out of copper and had to scrap a nearby garage diagnostic cart to get some more to finish connecting everything. After our masterpiece is complete, we then talk with Desdemona to begin the teleportation process. Normally, once you finish talking with Desdemona, you step onto the platform and listen to Tinker Tom give a big monologue before teleporting into the Institute. His monologue is super long. Luckily, we can be super rude and fast travel away about a second after stepping onto the platform, and if we timed it right, then when we load in, we'll teleport immediately, fully skipping the long spiel from Tom. Before this fast travel strat was found, we would skip the long monologue by making a quick save and load warping, which does the same exact thing as the fast travel, but the fast travel strat is just a few seconds faster. When we teleport into the Institute, we're going to immediately quick save and then throw down a frag mine to punch warp to the lower level of the Institute. Remember, we set this punch warp up when we loaded the memory den save after our chit chat with the Courser and Green Tech. After making a save for load warping later and setting up a punch warp, we quick loaded to go back to when we just loaded into the Institute, where we run up to a nearby terminal and load up the Institute relay targeting sequence that we pickpocketed off of Sturges so long ago. This is the big sequence break in the game, where we're loading an item from the nuclear option quest that we got in the sewer when we're supposed to be exploring the Institute for the first time. This caused Preston to teleport in even though we left him in the Museum of Freedom. There's a lot to why this is happening, but there isn't time to explain, so pause now to read this if you're interested. Preston handed us a fusion pulse charge, and we thanked him by activating our punch warp on him and then entering the door to the Institute Advanced Systems. Here we set up a punch warp and then enter the reactor level, where we're going to trigger our punch warp and warp to above the reactor area, where we then down warp by hitting an invisible plane which places us right in front of the reactor that we place the fusion pulse charge on. 
We then make a quick save and load warp to Diamond City, after which we then fast travel to the Railroad HQ. The load warping and fast traveling here entails a lot of loads, so I'd just like to take this moment and say thank you to all of you who continue to support the channel on Patreon. You absolutely don't have to chip into the channel, but you do anyways, and that means more than you know. If you want to support the channel, Patreon is one of the best ways you can, and by chipping in as little as $1 a month, you get access to videos early, updates on videos as they're being made, and the occasional Fan Fiction Friday video. Again, thank you so much for your support, and thank you for being patient with this video coming out. Hopefully the next video doesn't take so long, but knowing me, I'll likely bite off more than I can chew as usual. Back to the run, when we finish loading into the Railroad HQ, Desdemona is going to give a big speech. Big speeches are slow though, and we can skip it by blasting her a few times and aggroing everyone, and then putting away our weapon immediately so they forgive us and we get teleported back to the Institute peacefully. I've lost more record-paced runs than I care to admit because of not putting away our 10mm fast enough and everyone staying mad at me. When we load into the Institute, we then immediately pull up our Pip-Boy and fast travel back to the Railroad HQ, which for some reason works despite us being indoors and having not finished the quest institutionalized. At the Railroad HQ, we set up one final punch warp and talk with Tom real quick to update the quest, and after we say the fire it up line, we can then make a quick save and load warp on the advanced systems door that we made a save in front of earlier. This will bring us back to the Institute because we don't have the fast travel point for it, and it also updates the quest to the final stage where we just have to go to the teleporter room in the Institute and teleport to the Mass Fusion Executive Suite and press a button. After completing the load warp, we'll punch warp out of bounds to COC into the teleporter room, where we then get teleported to the final area of the game, where we'll press a button to finish off the game. The run officially ends when the HUD disappears, and I'll let you listen to how I reacted to this run on stream when it happened. Oh my god, this is going to be so fucking close. Oh my god, please don't crash. Please, please, please. Oh my god. Oh, please don't fucking crash. Please, please, please. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! That's gonna be like a 3557 or something. Oh my god, my biceps are twitching, dude. Jesus. Oh my god, it's over! Oh my god! Thank f I can this nightmare can end! Oh my god. If you somehow made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for sticking around. This run took me about two months of constant grinding to get, and I'm pretty happy with it. It's far from perfect, and if I put more time into it, I'm sure I could lower this record by up to about another 30 seconds, but for right now, I'd like to shift my focus back to making YouTube videos rather than grinding runs myself. If you're interested, I made the saves from this speedrun available for download if you want to play around with them to see what the wasteland is like after the run, or just if you want to run around at 300% speed. Link is in the description. That's about all for this video though. Let me know your thoughts on it by either leaving a comment below or joining my Discord server and leaving feedback there. Link is in the description and be sure to subscribe if you want to see more videos of speedruns being explained. This was an any% percent speedrun of Fallout 4. I've been Tomato Anus and I hope you have an above average day. The way we were. But now I know. I know I can't go back. I know the world has changed, that the road ahead will be hard. This time, I'm ready. Because I know war.